Okay, hello, hello to everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the first edition of Performing Resistance Dialogues on Us, Migration Inclusive Cities. Um, this international summer school is in the frame of Atlas of Transitions Biennale 2020. It is promoted by Emilia Romagna Teatro Fondazione, Department of Sociology and Business Law of the University of Bologna, and Cantieri Metici. This program, I want to remember, that supports Mediterranean, so donate and support you too. Uh, it is a series of talks, lectures, and dialogues featuring international scholars, activists, curators, and artists. So, my name is Ilenia Kaleo. I am a performer and a researcher, as well as an uh, activist in queer, uh, feminist, and commons struggle. Uh, some practical information. Uh, each talk lasts one hour. We will dialogue with our guests for the first 40 minutes, and then we will open to your comments and questions. So please feel free to write your question in the chat, and we will try to collect them and respond as many as possible. Don't hesitate, write. And now let me introduce our guest. Uh, it's a real pleasure um, to, for me to be in conversation with the feminist writer, Mina Salami. Hi, Mina. Hi, Elenia. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here. Me too. Mina, mm. Mina Salami is a Nigerian, Finnish and Swedish writer and lecturer. She works with words, images, ideas, pop cultures, memories, identities, mythologies, poetry and social media. Uh, creating a very original and powerful imaginaries about blackness and sexed, queer, and diasporic bodies. Uh, in uh, her work, she connects uh, uh, feminism, black feminism, with contemporary culture from an Africa-centered perspective. She is the founder of a very well-known blog, Miss Afropolitan, created in 2010. And uh, I have here in my hands uh, her books, that is uh, uh, Sensuous Knowledge, a Black Feminist Approach for Everyone, that is just published uh, by Z Books. And uh, in this book, Mina uh, reimagine and rewrite a new lexicon from a Black Feminist Africa centered perspective, starting from uh, this keyword. Uh, I read you. Knowledge, liberation, decolonization, identity, blackness, womanhood, sisterhood, power, and beauty. So these words create a sort of uh, a, a sort of a black feminist intertwined cartography of the present. I think that we'll, we will pass through uh, many of these keywords during the conversation because Mina rethink these words as conceptual tools to be used in order to understand and at the same time to shape and change uh, reality around us. So I would let Mina speak immediately, uh, opening with the first point. Okay. So, uh, first point, uh, starting from you, Mina, uh, as a feminist practices of politics of locations, how did you arrive to elaborate and reconceptualize the idea of census knowledge? According to the feminist uh, perspective that there is no position between matter and uh, intelligence, sensation and passions and knowledges, how did you work on the concept of corporeal knowledge? And which kind of black feminist approach and epistemologies have you outlined about the relationship between bodies, senses, emotions, and politics? Thank you, Elenia. Um, 
Thanks for the question. I'm going to respond in a second. I just want to first briefly say um, thanks to Atlas of Transitions for the invitation to participate and contribute to, to this wonderful dialogue and these exchanges. Um, please, everybody who's watching, do donate to, um, I believe some links have gone out. I think this is a really important cause, especially in our times. Um, and also, Elenia, that was a really, really wonderful um, introduction to to the work um, that I'm doing and the endeavors and the intentions of sensuous knowledge, my, my debut book. Um, so to give listeners a little bit more, more context, I guess, before addressing the, the specific questions, um, basically um, in sensuous knowledge, um, is it's a collection of, of essays about universal concepts like those Elenia mentioned. So, things like identity and power and knowledge and art and feminism and womanhood and blackness. Um, and uh, looking at these universal concepts through a, a worldview and a, and a paradigmatic approach that I refer to as sensuous knowledge. And um, in short, what sensuous knowledge is, is a kind of amalgamation or a, a synthesis of uh, emotional intelligence and rational thinking. Um, and the reason that I am adopting this approach, which um, rightly is a kind of um, incorporation of the corporeal, so embodiment um, and um, with the intellectual, is because um, I'm intending and working toward a, a kind of holistic integrated feminist empowerment. Um, so something, uh, an empowerment and transformation that involves the uh, entire individual and collective and not just fragments of it. Um, and so in order to approach these universal concepts, um, which, you know, are, are, are topics, so things like um, power and knowledge, these are concepts that impact everybody's life. Um, and yet, so many of us have not had the opportunities or the, the, um, the right, the human right to actually influence um, and shape these concepts, despite how much they impact our lives. And, um, and so in order to, to like tie in all of these things that I'm talking about and to bring about um, sensuous knowledge when looking at these concepts, um, what I, what I, what I figured um, the way to approach that is by interweaving, um, as I've said, emotional intelligence with, with rational thinking, but what is actually that? How do you do that? Um, and so the way that I approach that is by interweaving uh, things like, um, as the title of this talk, science and art, but more specifically, academic uh, research with black feminist theory, with African philosophy, um, but also with um, with a kind of mythopoetic narrative and arts, um, creativity and imagination. Um, and I, um, I contrast this, this framework, this, this paradigm that I refer to as sensuous knowledge with another framework, which is the dominant one. And I call that Europatriarchal knowledge. Um, you know, this, this, this framework, um, which emanates from uh, the Western domination of knowledge production and has, you know, it's referred to by many names. Um, the black feminist scholar Bell Hooks calls it a, a white supremacist, militarist patriarchy. Um, and, you know, it's in, in many circles is just known as enlightenment thinking. Um, but I specifically call it Europatriarchal knowledge because what my book does is um, it, it, I'm kind of looking at the the narrative, the the story um, that has produced this dominant form of epistemology. Um, so you could it's kind of like the framing story rather than the actual structure um, of white supremacy or capitalism or patriarchy or militarism. Um, and the 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 contrast between your patriarchal knowledge and sensuous knowledge is that your patriarchal knowledge rather than seeking to integrate and, and synthesize these different elements that contribute to what we know and 
the way that we know and why we know things. Um, it instead is a worldview which, um, which fragments knowledge. So it separates between rational thought and emotional intelligence. It, it kind of positions these as always being in, in contention with each other. Um, it separates and divides between um, the embodied and the, the things that can be quantified. In fact, it is a, it is a worldview which is obsessed with, with quantification and measurement and assessment. And why is that? Um, that is because these tools, when used in knowledge production, um, they aid to a political um, and socioeconomic structure which is based on hierarchy and domination and where a small elite are able to profit and exclude other groups. Um, now, um, why did I, how did I come to this, you asked? Um, I have been, um, I've basically, I've been, I've been writing and speaking about feminism and um, Pan-Africanism and Black liberation for over a decade. Um, and I've spoken about these themes and related topics in um, all kinds of varying uh, institutions and platforms. So from grassroots organizations to big um, corporate conferences to political institutions to universities and in, in all around the world, in Asia, Africa, Latin America, the US, Europe. And, um, and what I found that you know the the people that I engage with, the 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 knowledge that I engage with, and the narratives that I that I am privy to have to be in conversation with, is that there is, um, especially in our times when there are so many contradictory messages and so much information out there, yet so much confusion, there is a really strong uh, desire and um, and consequent action that is taken toward transformation and political change. Um, and yet, there seems to be um, there's a there's a something that is preventing the actual manifestation of these desires and actions. And of course, there are many things that inform this. But what one, one, one thing that occurred to me is that um, we cannot use the old thinking to create new ways of being. And very often, that's what we were still doing. So we were using, um, you know, we, when, when we did alter old thinking, we were often looking at kind of altering the structures. Um, but I found it to be very rare that we were looking at altering the actual root of the structures, which is the knowledge production, which is the idea of, of what, you know, these, these universal concepts that I've mentioned earlier, among many others, um, how they are defined. So for instance, if you think about a concept like power, which is one of the chapters in my book, um, power is um, something that obviously, you know, in feminist spaces, in black liberation spaces, it is such a central concept. And yet um, there are very few um, reimaginations of the term itself. So while we're trying to reimagine the structures, we're still using the old understanding of what power means. And this is an understanding that has been defined by Europatriarchal knowledge um, as something which is about dominance, which is about manipulation and control, often using violence. And so long as we are using this understanding of power, we cannot produce the outcome that we're seeking to produce. And so, for instance, in this chapter, um, what I'm doing, therefore, is applying sensuous knowledge um, to power, in this case, and using all of these things that I mentioned. So both the, um, the, the, the rational, the reasoning, the analysis of academic research and theory, but also um, the, the poetic and the imaginative. Um, and so I coin a, a concept called exusions, which which kind of comes to embody um, this, this, this nuanced um, way of, or, or new um, uh, way of thinking about power that is rooted in feminism and black liberation and Pan-Africanism. Um, and I think you, you also mentioned um, the kind of method methodology of, of coming to this. Um, so in order to, to, to write 
uh, sensuous knowledge. And generally, you know, for anybody who, who uh, reads the book, um, you know, some readers have asked, like, how do you put sensuous knowledge into practice? And I guess I, by sharing the way that I went about it writing the book, um, it's basically, sorry, one second. <laughs> if, if there's, you know, if there's one message that sensuous knowledge is about that I'm advocating for, it's, it's bringing in the practice of, of synthesis into both you know, the personal and the political spaces. And so when I was writing, for instance, a chapter about power or all of the chapters, um, I was, I was um, you know, involving, you could say that sensuous knowledge is a kind of mind, body and soul approach to knowledge production, so a holistic approach. And so I was meditating, but also um, looking for information about power or beauty or knowledge or art or whatever topic I was addressing in, um, in the natural world, um, looking at art, doing interviews both with um, researchers in academia, but also with, um, for example, with uh, Mama Lao, which is a, a priest, uh, a priestess of, of Yoruba spirituality. So just really bringing in that, an approach that is about synthesizing, interweaving, um, entangling um, the different things that inform our lives, because we aren't just, you know, um, as your patriarchal knowledge would, would posit, we aren't, we aren't robotic, we don't just function from one prism, we, we, we have multiple layers. Um, so to, to round up this question, um, I would say, where your patriarchal knowledge is focused on a singular way of knowing um, when it comes to universal concepts, sensuous knowledge by contrast is focused on a, a multi-layered approach to knowing. Yes. Maybe we can connect uh, to another question that is the second focus that is about uh, Mina, the question of uh, black representation, uh, of representation of the black, gendered, non-binary, migrant, invisibilized borders from the diaspora, that is a specific condition. And how, do, uh, how to escape the heteropatriarchal uh, gaze? You, in your book, you talk about rituals, about practices of self-care, goddess narratives. As you say, and, and it is in the very beginning of the book, uh, blackness is not an alternative. That is to say that is not a question of deconstructing something of opposite, uh, but of creating otherwise. Uh, you say there is nothing of new here. It seems new uh, only in Europatriarcha perspective. And this is, for me, this is a very crucial point in order to decolonize and decentralize cultural representations from Eurocentrism. Would you like to go deeper in the issue of representations and about this? Yeah, um, so when I say blackness is not an alternative, what I mean is that, you know, for me to, to address a concept like identity, um, or womanhood, I it, because it's quite often that when a, when a black woman um, writes about such a concept or thinks about such an idea, um, mm -hmm. it is positioned as something that is new or alternative. Because of course the norm is the Europatriarchal view. Um, but what I'm arguing is that uh, you know it is not new or alternative to me or to other black women who, who are writing and thinking about these things. You know, these, this is the only, the, the black uh, perspective, so to speak, is the only perspective that I know as far as race is concerned. And the female perspective is the angle that I embody as far as gender is, is con concerned. But it's important to, um, to emphasize that the point in sensuous knowledge is not to um, is not to, to fight and battle and argue with the Europatriarchal view, which also it's important to say 
is not synonymous with white men. Um, you know, uh, it's it's a worldview. Your patriarchal knowledge is a worldview, um, and so my intention is not to to fight with this worldview because what that does is it centers it. Um, and rather, what I am seeking to do. So in the book, I use the metaphor of a mountain. And um, so just briefly, if you imagine that you um, that there's a there's a mountain, and you know, for for millennia. Um, People have seen this mountain from, from one angle, um, so from the left, let's say. And, you know, they've told a story about this mountain, and it's a story that the, there's the, it's very dry, it's very arid. Um, there's just specific type of shrubs and maybe some cacti or um, some, some kind of land animals. And so this is the story about the mountain for millennia. And let's then say that, all this time, on the other side, on the right side of the mountain, there are there's a huge uh, population, and what they see is something completely different. They see a different mountain. To them, it is a lush mountain where there's rainfall and fogginess all the time, and there's you know all kinds of birds and um, plants and trees and this, that, and the other. And so, if this group are were to um, to tell their story about the mountain, they are not, and let's say that the mountain is these universal concepts, um, the political, the social, and the embodied kinds of concepts that we're, we're discussing. Um, what this group is, is doing is enriching the knowledge about the mountain rather than screaming over, you know, to the other side at the the first group who have who have shaped the story. Um, and if they were to do that, if they were to be screaming and say, no, you got it wrong. It's not like the, we have this tree and we have this bird. What does that end up doing but centering the, the person who got it wrong? Um, so what is very important here is that this is about enriching uh, knowledge production. And in, in that process, of course, uh, you know, there are things that the, the first group of people who were telling the story about the mountain might have got right. Um, there are things that they might have actually produced, you know, very beautifully. So it's absolutely also acknowledging that that is possible. Now, while this is all, you know, about a, is kind of using a, a fable um, and a metaphor, there is, of course, a, a, uh, a, a strong political element to this enriching um, it's uh, enriching knowledge when it has been misconstrued and uh, diminished for so long in ways that has produced so much um, political, social, and spiritual suffering um, is also a simultaneous pro uh, protest, you could say. It is a critique um, of, of, a, of a kind of singular um, method methodology of, of knowledge production. Um, it is also a, uh, you know, you spoke about self-care, and it is, in that regard, it is also something that the Black feminist scholar Audre Lorde um, is famous for, for kind of coining this idea of self-care as something political. And if we use this example, we can really see um, why there is such a political charge here. Because if you, um, if you have been, if you have seen the mountain in a specific way for so long, but everything around you, your education, your, your family, your political institutions um, told you that, you know, that you were crazy for seeing these things and or didn't allow you to, to voice them, then what you develop is what um, the, the, the author um, W.E.B. Du Bois called double consciousness. Um, he said this already in 1902 or 1903, um, and it's sadly still a very relevant concept. And I would argue that in the case of black women, we probably even have like a triple consciousness. And so what this, what double consciousness is, is basically that you, you see the world through your own eyes, you know, you're, you're aware of the experiences, how experiences, how concepts are shaped due to your race, um, in the case of double consciousness, with triple consciousness, it would be your race and gender. And then you're also aware of how the dominant narrative um, constructs these ideas. And this means that you constantly live with this sense of 
it's like a misalignment um, because what you see and what is told is is are so different. Um, and so this is where the self care and and this the sense of enriching knowledge and of sensuous knowledge and of voicing what we see and placing um, you know one three very central things for for sensuous knowledge in the book is that um, it is it is Africa centered, it is woman centered, and it is rooted in black feminist theory um, because you know you have to place yourself as subject when you're looking at these concepts because in that process there's both this kind of political protest but also uh, a sense of a sense of healing um, and to give you some some really like concrete examples of this um, you know in in our contemporary discourses um, if you think about Black Lives Matter um, happening right now and the kinds of the narrative that is being told and there are there are several obviously but one that is very interesting to me and I've been thinking about is how uh, you know so much of the relationship between white people and black people is being framed by the relationship between white men and black men um, and there's a there's a very specific type of relationship that exists between white women and black women and that isn't the dominant narrative of black lives matter now this relationship is in it's it's both more contentious in in, in many ways um and but it is it also um in those spaces where where it where it where it glues together where it is about healing it is more successful than the relationships between black men and white men. Um, I'm generalizing, obviously, but you know, when you look, there was a story actually in today's Guardian about uh, uh, the organization Women Deliver, which is a huge, um, you know, feminist organization, feminist, I might want to add quotation marks there because it isn't um, looking at all women's lives. And you know, it's their CEO has stepped down because of accusations of racism. Um, but these aren't the kinds of stories that frame the, the conversation about Black Lives Matter. So what happens here is that for Black women, there's, you know, we're feeling a sense of, there's a discord, there's a kind of dissociation because as much as we obviously are, are involved and 100% are supportive of Black Lives Matter, um, the vast majority of us anyway, there is a, a, a sense that, you know, it's being framed in this patriarchal way. Um, so these are the kinds of, of, of things this is the kind of double consciousness. And you know, what is interesting is that when we look at double consciousness, we think of it first and foremost from the, um, the prism of, of black people, um, obviously, because that's how the, the phrase was coined. But actually, you know, what is interesting as well is what, how much knowledge um, and, and, and how misinformed white people are in a Euro patriarchal knowledge system. So another story that, that has been in, in the news today is um, the British foreign minister, Dominic Raab, who um, thought that, you know, taking the knee, which is a, a gesture of the Black Lives Matter protest, is, a, is something that came out of, um, what's the name of this series that I haven't watched, Game of Thrones. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is knowledge that for, Black people, and you know, I, I also believe that for the majority of, of white people, anyway, those who are conscious and, and aware of these issues, know that it's like a gesture of protest. You might not know that it is specifically was started by Colin Kaepernick um, because he didn't want to sing the anthem um, standing, and so he took the knee. But you know, my point is that this is a crucial piece of information in black lives and yet somebody of such political influence doesn't even know the, the source of it before speaking on it and this is actually this is ignorance um but it is you know it, it, your patriarchal knowledge frames it as within this superiority narrative um and misses that actually you are you are miseducated and you're misinformed when you don't have this this kind of information so Very interesting. What are you saying? And uh, just for going uh, on, uh, I, I would like 
as something about identity more uh, more and more because you um, you mean to make a, um, a very original and powerful use of the concept of the identity and history too as a space a space of possibility the possibility of rewriting reinvention recreating uh, um, identity in your vision is not a static and predetermined field and um, I am especially referring to your works on Yoruba mythology, for example, uh, and to the mixture of genealogies, cosmologies, and contemporary culture that you continuously create in your work. And I, I would like to connect uh, this work um, to the point five uh, of the Afropolitan Manifesto, when you say that Afropolitanism is anachronistic. Uh, so, another idea of temporality, divergent from the linear one of modernity and progress, uh, which is, I quote, simultaneously historic, present, and futuristic. Uh, it seems to be, to me, a very uh, radical political point about mm, the time, the temporality, because it escaped the risk of uh, to desiring a sort of authentic past uh, in a conservative perspective. And uh, your proposal uh, about identity seems to me um, all affirmative and transformative, uh, center on active practices of rewriting, invention, imagination, also of the heritage. Uh, uh, I, I, I can call it an exercise in political imagination in contemporary world. Uh, could you tell us more um, about that in your perspective, which is, uh, uh, which is the relationship between memory, identity and fiction? And what is the role of the imagination and of the art too? if it exists in this process. How do, as you write uh, in your book, stories transforms into matter? Um, thank you, Lenya. Your questions are amazing. Um, and yes, obviously, I think um, that art is and imagination, um, you know, central as they are to sensuous knowledge at large, are also uh, extremely and especially important when it comes to questions about identity and collective memory. Um, you see, we talk about collective memory um, and we don't really question, and we, we, we sort of focus more on um, what memory is mm. in this phrase, you know, like how do we, what are we speaking about? Are we talking about education or wars and pogroms, etc. But actually, you know, what is collective? Who is the collective um, when we speak about collective memory? Um, because when it comes to um, identity, uh, you know, what I what I what I argue is that there's a there's been a kind of theft of normative identity. Um, so due to the the history of uh, your, of how your patriarchal knowledge has aided to the history of uh, colonization and um, enslavement of people around the world. And, and um, this, this long trajectory of positioning the ideas, the attitudes, the, the structures, the, the work of uh, elite white men into the project of, of structuring society. Um, what it has ultimately led to is where we are now, which is a world in which the normative identity is that of the white male. Um, this does not mean that, you know, a white male should want to like strip off his skin or his maleness, um, of course not. But th this is, it's, it's, it's just how it functions. So for instance, when we look at, um, any of our sort of uh, identities, professions, um, roles that people play in society. So if we say, if we say a scientist or an artist, um, seeing that those are the framing uh, topics of our, of our discussion today, um, the, when we say a scientist, we mean a white male scientist. 
in popular discourse, everybody else is is kind of hyphenated. So we would say, you know, an Asian scientist, a woman artist, a black writer. Um, uh, and this is what I mean has happened and, and that I define as the normative identity theft. Mm -hmm. um, the issue, I mean, that in itself is obviously a big issue. The, the issue for, because if you remember, we're looking at this from the uh, Africa-centered, woman-centered, black-centered um, perspective. The issue for us is that we become, um, we, we, we are kind of in a crime scene now because if this, if a theft of normative identity has occurred, we are having to prove and, and you know, allege and show um, how this is a crime scene. And so our identities become uh, amalgamated and synonymous with struggle and with contention. Um, and this is also a problem because that means that we can't really focus on, on um, you know, the human rights to have, to have joy and to, to, to thrive and to be creative and imaginative because we're constantly um, in, a, in a mode of, of battle, if you like. Um, and so identity is, is a concept that is especially important to grapple with in our times because it is, you know, if you think about uh, many of p the political movements of just a few decades back, um, civil rights, the second wave feminist movement, and even on the right, you know, where you have um, the, the kind of fascist movements and all of that, um, they were ideological. Whereas in our times, political movements are so much connected precisely to identity. So Black Lives Matter is obviously uh, very much about identity, as is Me Too. Um, and again, you have, you know, on the right, the alt-right movement, uh, libertarianism, like all our political movements are so connected to identity. And uh, so, so there is a need to bring in um, the imaginative um, and to to really sort of, what I what I suggest in the book is, for us to, to view identity as a compass. Um, so, you know, rather than something that we, we kind of rigidly hold on to, um, identity as a compass means that we, we take pride and we embrace and we are absolutely aware of the, of the many intersectional ways that our, our identities are politicized, but we, we kind of have a looser um, approach to them. Um, and, then we can also analyze the the histories of uh, colonization and and slavery because it's also important to understand that the the normative identity theft occurs um, in both it it is the occupation of both physical terrain but also psychological terrain and these things work in tandem um, it is also uh, you know, th there's so many omissions when we when we speak about this. So, for one, when we when we think about uh, the 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 murder um, of so many millions of Black lives, we're often looking at um, the situation in the diaspora. Um, you know, and and the transatlantic slave trade, obviously, starting from there. But also, you know, um, colonization was a murderous event. In fact, I think, you know, more lives were lost to colonization than to the transatlantic slave trade. There were wars fought in, you know, what is today South Africa, Zimbabwe, Kenya, um, Algeria, as well as in Southeast Asia, in Sri Lanka, like so many um, wars were fought in order to colonize and occupy these territories. And that also tells you that um, there was a lot of resistance. So that's th these are also stories that that aren't really out there in 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 the popular uh, and contemporary narrative, and nor are the nor is the the knowledge and the realization that the same process of of physical and psychological occupation of territory is what happened and what has historically happened to women by men. Um, so you have the same thing of of. Uh, monopolizing power through um, occupation of, of physical territory. In, in women's case, this is often the body, um, you know, so using 
practices, witch hunting, um, female genital mutilation, uh, breast ironing, foot binding, um, just general violence and sexual abuse, pedophilia, rape, all of these things are uh, a form of colonialism, colonial yeah. occupation of the, of the female body. And then once that has been used to monopolize power, you're able to also shape the narrative um, in a way that, that others, women, um, through sexist advertising or um, uh, conventional and traditional ideas about motherhood and the list is endless. Um, but basically these are the, this is the kind of uh, strategy that goes into what ultimately becomes the normative identity theft and why we position uh, whiteness and maleness and um, you know the, the, the long list of other sort of privileged embodiments of, of ableism, of, of class and so on. Um, into what we what we deem to be the norm. Thank you, Mina. Maybe um, we can pick up some questions from uh, our chat. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just one. Yeah. This one. I don't know if. So it's from Angela Shavilla. Uh, which is, for you, the political role of the beauty in the terms of anti-Russian struggle and decolonization? You have said something, but maybe you can tell us more about beauty as political concept or political practices. Hi, Angela. Um, thank you for the, for the question. I think that beauty is a really uh, significant concept to look at. Uh, within this 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 discussion, because um, beauty is something that, uh, for one, has been defined um, specifically in very particular ways by Europatriarchal knowledge. So, um, going all the way back to constructions about um, Eve in the Bible um, and how uh, her appearance was defined by um, your patriarchs, you could say, over the ages, in a way that very much privileged um, whiteness, um, but also that that devalued femininity, um, objectified femininity, and in our times we see that beauty is very much connected to capitalism. Um, you know, there's a there's been a commodification that is connected to the objectification of of, of women. Um, and the first thing to say here is that, you know, the idea that beauty in itself should be connected to women is part of the Europatriarchal knowledge narrative because um, it's, it, you know, there's so much political meaning in beauty in a way that there isn't in the term handsome, for example, which is how we describe men. So men get to, to inhabit this, you know, these, these labels that don't have a, a particular political weight that they then have to grapple with day in, day out, and that, you know, de facto influences their lives on this planet. Um, and then following this politicized definition of beauty, um, women are encouraged um, from a very early age, in fact, from the day they were born pretty much, um, to expend capital on achieving this Europatriarchal idea of beauty. Um, and by capital, I don't only mean um, money, but you know, social capital, um, energy, um, ideas, time, uh, confidence, all of these things. Um, and the second thing is that this all ties into um, this is so strategic and smart on behalf of Europatriarchal knowledge because beauty is important to women. It is, it is important to everyone, but there's something in how womanhood is constructed that makes us, um, you know, when you look at women historically in leadership, in arts, in social institutions, within the family, um, we, we are prone to, to catering to the aesthetic. And so, of course, when you... Um, when you realize if you want to oppress a group, you know, take something that is clearly of importance to them and politicize it 
commercialize it, turn it into something that actually works against them. Um, so what I argue in my book concerning beauty is that, you know, this is really a concept that we need to take ownership of. We need to, to reimagine using sensuous knowledge. Um, and yeah. So another question from the chat. It's from uh, Martina Vedeschi Bucci. Okay. Uh, since Europatriarchal violence is in some way interwoven with colonial violence, what can we do to decolonize our mind? And you have uh, talked about that before. Uh, maybe you, you, you can say us more. And I, um, I want to connect uh, uh, to another uh, issue that you uh, address in your book uh, about institutions, cultural institutions or artistic institutions or institutions of uh, I don't know what, but new and uh, no existing institution, uh, because there's an issue that uh, also in uh, the other, in the past uh, meetings and dialogues uh, uh, came out, because you, um, about uh, uh, decolonization, you write that we need, uh, uh, I quote, cultural monuments, museum and memorial that weave the legacy of slavery and colonialism. You know, we need, uh, you say, space for mourn, for pain, and also for memories. Uh, so maybe we can take together this, this issue between uh, um, so decolonize and the role of the institutions. If there Great, is. yeah. Um, thanks, Martina, and thanks, Elenia, for speaking a little bit. So I got to just take a break. <laughs> I feel like I've been talking so much. Um, yeah, uh, so that's another fantastic question i really appreciate it um because it's it's so important it's so timely um the question of decolonization that is and we are approaching it in in ways that are problematic um there's for example a really strong emphasis on uh the political side of decolonization um there's a strong emphasis on on um, language, for example. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the central argument in decolonization studies for many decades was when it came to Africa, for example, was this question of indigenous language and, and needing to, you know, revert back to, to, to ethnic languages, um, which is obviously a, a fantastic and important part of the struggle. But um, I think, you know, in terms of decolonizing the mind in a way that, so ultimately what decolonizing the mind is, is developing and cultivating a mind that cannot be manipulated. It's really important to understand that. Cultivating a mind that cannot be manipulated is obviously an endeavor and a task that um, involves so many different things and practices and, and knowledge systems, which is again why sensuous knowledge is so vital because it, decolonization um, is really something that has to be approached in in a holistic way for it to, to have an, uh, a lasting effect. Mm. And so one of the things, I mean, when I said that we're centralizing a kind of jargoned, um, heavily academic approach, you could say, to decolonization, which I think is, is um, concerning because decolonization is, is, is something that has to be for the masses. You know, it cannot, we will not achieve decolonized societies unless decolonization is framed by a language that uh, everyone can, can be informed by. Um, and so, you know, this goes to to the point about um, having spaces for memory um, and the poetic, as you were saying, uh, Elenia, that, you know, you, uh, I, I think that with decolonization, we basically, we attempt it at the moment, we, we speak of it, it's almost like we think that the D means, means something that you can detach or remove, uh, you know, in the way that you might remove an old piece of furniture um, and throw it away. Um, and that creates 
this this um, like a, a almost a, a paranoia um, because you sort of think, oh, I'm failing at decolonization because I still have this this male supremacist voice or this white supremacist voice that every so often pops up in my head. Um, but that isn't what decolonization is. You know, you can't you can't you can't swallow a pill. Um, a decolonization pill and and wake up the next day free of it. Um, rather, it is this slow process. It's kind of a it's like a hybrid. Um, it's 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 bringing together knowledge from from Euro patriarchal knowledge um, from uh, you know different uh, indigenous cultures. It's really slowly evaluating what is true, what is healing, what is positive. Um, and from a very critical point of view, then challenging that which is oppressive and false, um, with the ultimate goal being that you can, that you as an individual and you as part of the collective, that we all stay uh, focused on that the ultimate goal is that we need to thrive. We need to, we need to attain a, a, some kind of, um, grounding um, and ease with being in this world. Um, you know, this is, the, the, this is what it means to, to have human rights, ultimately. It means that you can, you can exist in a, in a satisfying way um, with challenges, but in a satisfying way. And what colonization has done is that it makes us, um, it makes that impossible for, for groups that are not seen as the norm. Um, you know, it makes it very, very challenging. It's, it's, a, it's a huge labor, a huge political and spiritual labor to do away with the oppressive thinking. Um, so decolonization is really about uh, finding a way to have a mind that can't be ma manipulated and that is grounded and, and centered. Thank you, Mina. So uh, there is a, a comment from Bakare Babatunde from Nigeria that uh, I would like to read you. Bakare write, kindly explain to the analogy you made about Yoruba women at the beginning of this lecture better. I am a Yoruba and I'm from Nigeria. And uh, maybe we can connect these comments to another, maybe the last one, question from uh, Lorenzo Ippolito. Uh, Lorenza uh, writes, I work with a group of queer women, part of a poetry group. We talk a lot about kinship and how to find different way of being together that escape patriarchal family structures. Can you talk to how to the center the concept of family from Western conceptions of family and how the project family has colonized ways of being together? Um, I'm trying to just find that question so I can. Okay, there we see. Lorenzo. Uh, Lorenzo. Uh, okay, um, thank you, Bakari and Lorenza. Um, so the analogy about Yoruba women, I can't quite remember what I said, but, um, you know, definitely the philosophies um, of Yoruba women and various uh, groups of African people um, and indigenous people around the world inform sensuous knowledge. Um, to give a quick example, um, there is the uh, philosopher um, Sophie Bosede Oluole, um, and she um, is a huge inspiration for me generally, but also in the book. Um, and her approach is especially important because um, Professor Oluole always centered um, herself. So herself as a, as a feminist, as a woman, and as a person um, of Yoruba and Nigerian heritage and African heritage. Um, and so she, you know, she really shows how that can work in, in theory and in the philosophical space. Somebody who uh, you could say practices the kinds of philosophies that that Professor Oluole wrote about is the Yoruba um, activist, businesswoman, feminist activist, Nike 
Ogundaike, um, who runs the largest art center in, in, in West Africa. This is, she, she hosts, she has the Nike Art Gallery in Lagos. Um, and she uses art in a way to, to, to do feminist activism, to do Pan-Africanism, to probe into the kinds of uh, questions that, that we've been discussing. And one question that she, she for instance, has, has spoken about a lot is um, this notion of family. Um, and I, I, I want to say that, you know, it's not about, I don't want to romanticize uh, Yoruba notions of family or any African or any global notions of family because patriarchy is a global order. Um, so when I say Europatriarchal knowledge, is that's looking at the, the dominant global system, but there is an equivalent uh, Afropatriarchal knowledge as well. Um, and that is certainly something that informs the concept of a family in Yoruba land, for instance, um, which is not to say that there aren't, you know, there's like feminist approaches there have always been um, toward Afro-patriarchal structures of family. Um, but I think that the Western, the Euro-patriarchal concept of family is, is especially dangerous in that it is so connected to, um, to these heteronormative um, capitalist ideas, which are de facto um, like ruining um, the world, you know, in like when you look at nature, we, we, we are over consuming. And so much of this uh, consumption culture um, is, is, is actually tied to our idea of of the family, um, you know, this patriarchal idea of which starts from the very early days with the ownership of land, which is something that you know should not be owned by any one human or group of humans. Um, but the ownership of land, and then how that connects to, um, you know, the ownership of land is is ultimately to secure uh, wealth and goods. Um, that have been exploited within a family, which then is defined in a very rigid way, heteronormative way, to involve, uh, you know, a, a, a gendered male and female and their offspring, and who then continue to accumulate wealth and so on and so forth. Um, so th this is a really contentious idea of family, and we, we can and should be inspired by, um, you know, in many indigenous cultures, uh, family is much more fluid. Um, there are uh, the, the family in in West African cultures is is very gendered, but there is a there is a kind of poetry um, to the way that you have uh, female spaces and male spaces um, and androgynous spaces because in each space. Uh, the individual is able to access uh, agency and power within that space. Um, and, and so there's therein a kind of uh, poetic fluid movement. Um, this is something that we can, we can learn a lot from. Um, there is also such a connection between the protection of nature um, and family in West African uh, metaphysics. You know, there's the, the family is is it's almost the exact opposite of, of what it is in the Euro patriarchal tradition where you know the consumption and exploitation of nature is interwoven where here the you know the, the veneration in its own way a point of criticism um, you know but there's a veneration of natural elements that informs what the family is and the lineages uh, you know who who is from um, you know, your family name could literally be tied to a specific mountain or river um, that that you happen to live nearby, and so there's this this huge regard and veneration for that particular natural element, and it must not be exploited and destroyed. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, there's there's definitely a lot that can be unpacked there. So we are almost at the end, but maybe we. Have time for uh, a last question, Mina, if you want. Sure. <laughs> I can see there's many questions. So <laughs> yes, we can do, thank we can you do to one. everyone. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you so much to everyone for a great question. So that a lot of comments and 
questions maybe we can finish uh, uh, connecting about the question of migration that is also the core issue of this program and there is a question from natalie moran as you're talking about the normative identity theft and our life becoming a synonym of struggle how do you see uh, this in art related to migra migration which approach should we have in mind to avoid being dragged into this normative identity center in being white and male but maybe the core of other migration what do you think about yeah um i mean art plays a fundamental role obviously here um partly in documenting so you know there's so many uh amazing photographers, um, documentary makers, artists, um, but also, you know, dancers, singers, poets, um, who, who do this work of, of documenting and giving voice to such a, a neglected um, a, a atrocity and oppression in our world. Um, and yeah, I think that that is something that we can only, utilize more which is again you know why sensuous knowledge is an approach to, to knowledge it's a worldview and obviously you know there's other ways that you could you could phrase it um but but this a worldview that is about synthesizing and interweaving is necessary when it comes to all of the many atrocities this world faces and perhaps most of all when it comes to uh migration um, you know, because this is an issue that is, it has become so entwined in kind of in the statistics of it that nobody uh, really connects with on a visceral level. You know, we, we hear these uh, numbers of people that, that drown and die and escape and have no food and all of these situations and human trafficking of children, of women. And yet, um, you know, it's it's bizarre how such new stories can just sort of pass us by. Um, and, and I think that art really can can help to viscerally connect people to these issues. And and of course, you know, that's that's the first the first step in taking action is is actually caring. Um, so art has this this ability to make us to make us care, to get to, to make us attentive. Um, yeah, I think I'll I'll end with that word um, attentive. Um, that's that's a key aim and intention um, of of sensuous corporeal embodied knowledge is that it can really make us attentive and from there on transform society. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Min. I think that our time is over, and uh, I would like to thank very much all the people you. You were very present and active and thank you for uh, all the comments on all the questions. And uh, thank you to Pierzandra um, and to Emmanuel and to all the staff of uh, Performing Resistance. And more all, uh, thank you, Mina. <laughs> it was uh, a brilliant conversation and I hope uh, uh, to have you very soon in Italy to continue and to think together and to imagine with you um but thank you elenia thank so you. do i it was thanks for the great questions and thanks to everyone who came thank you bye bye mm -hmm.